Hi, I'm Dr. David Day of Samurai Digital Security, and this is 404 Cybersecurity Not Found, telling cybersecurity a new R since 2015. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode. I'm joined today by Dr. David Day, and we're going to be talking about risk assessments and the potential problems with, with them. So the first question, Dave, probably is why you should do a risk assessment in the first place. Just in general, if somebody's talking to me about cybersecurity and is is keen to know what the first steps would be, my response is that the first step should always be a risk assessment, you know, because we're, we're, we're afforded usually a budget. Um, the, the mechanisms for how much of that budget goes towards cybersecurity usually aren't particularly well thought out because there's not a lot of expertise behind it. I guess you would think I would say this, but most of the time the budget isn't um, sufficient or it should be more. So either way, you're normally working with a restricted budget. And how do you know, right, what you should spend your money on? How do you know whether you should spend it on, you know, the prevention of phishing or whether you should prevention of ransomware or, you know, denial of service attacks? Where are you going to put the money? right are you going to strengthen your perimeter network perimeter are you more concerned now because you're moving to cloud about the cloud infrastructure being safe you know there's a there's it's such an incredibly broad subject and the with such a, a varied amount of attack surfaces that how do you know right you can read different reports gartner reports or you know whatever the latest hot cybersecurity report is and fight your way through the statistics. But ultimately, you know, you, you, you're left kind of unsure where to put your money. So if you, if you want to have some assurances as to how best to protect yourself within the budget that you have, you need to do a risk assessment, right? You need to know where the problems are, what the worst problems are, what the impact, if those issues were realized would be, what the likelihood of them happening would be, how much it's going to cost and how much effort and resource is it going to take to resolve those? Because you need to make decisions. You need to have that, that information to make that decision, right? It's important to have, I don't know, a seatbelt in your car or an airbag in your car. But is that the most important thing? You know, if you if you have a if you have a, a an engine which is uh, has a terrible electrical wiring fault that's next to the petrol, you know, is it not more important to get that sorted out before you 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 fix your airbags, for example? And you don't know, right? You, unless you look at your organisation and think about it, you, you you don't know. So of course, that's why you need to put a risk assessment first because. Otherwise, you you know you you're putting the cart before the horse, aren't you? Mm. So, if somebody's looking to to go down this path and, and start doing risk assessments on their business, what's the usual approach that people take? So, I think the the standard approach to doing this uh, it, it all depends if you call in if you call in a cybersecurity consultancy, and then of course it depends which cybersecurity consultancy you call in. But oftentimes, you know, when you're at this point and thinking, well, I, I think I will do a risk assessment, where do you go? Maybe I think commonly you'd think, well, let's have a look at the frameworks that are out there. You know, so I'll have a look at NIST. Um, I'll have a look at the CIS 20 controls. Perhaps more commonly, I'll have a look at ISO 27001. And, and, you know, follow it through step by step, or maybe, uh, maybe you look at ISO 22301 for business continuity and think, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm just going to work through it pragmatically step by step, answer the questions that it asks, or the IASME governance, you know, um, questions, and I'm just going to go through them one at a time, and, and go and do it that way, which, you know, I think has some merits in itself and uh, but i'd say that's probably the typical way that people people go through it yeah so just uh, applying a framework to their business yeah are there yeah. any problems in that approach uh yeah uh, there is 
uh, many actually. One of the problems first off is a lot of those frameworks are tied to accreditations or certifications and they're, they're, they're worthwhile goes, goals to pursue because they offer some stakeholder confidence in your organization. And, and of course, it's better to do, to do something rather than nothing, right? But the downside to that, that, those is, is twofold. Um, the first one is, from an accreditation point of view, it's subjective. So people, you know, who make a decision about whether you tick, tick the box to say, that you you know you you have a a, a thorough uh, and well documented business continuity plan which is tested every six months all of those things which i've just said there are open to interpretation so how much is done every six months how in depth is it done every six months it's step by step what takes place in those tests is it thorough well that's subjective as well. It's down to the interpretation on the person who ticks the box, right? So they're, they're, they're not perfect examples of comparison. The idea behind standards, of course, is to say, if company X has ISO 27001 and company Y has ISO 27001, then they're comparable in terms of their cybersecurity posture. And, you know, we know that isn't the case because we've seen companies with ISO 27001 that have implemented it brilliantly and tailored it for their organization. And we've seen examples of people with ISO 27001, which have just left me wondering how on earth they could possibly have obtained it other than potentially being disingenuous. So there's, there's, there's the problem of, of subjectivity with it uh, on, on one side. And then I think the, the other problem with sort of following a standard framework as well is that not all companies are the same are they right so you know you have ISO 27001 but you don't have ISO 27001 for the financial sector ISO 27001 for the health sector ISO 20001 for the rail industry or whatever it might be that doesn't happen like that and even then you know, you could you could argue, I don't know, the financial sector could be broken down into subsectors. And then operationally, how a company does its business is going to be different from another company, even one within the same sector doing the same role. They the way they work is different. So we're in this position where we're trying to get a one size fits all approach. And it 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 reminds me of it reminds me of a story I heard, and I can't remember where I read this actually, um, about there being incidents with flight accidents. I think this was with World War II planes where a lot of accidents were happening and they, they, they determined that a lot of these accidents were happening due to the distance between the controls and the flight seat in the cockpit. And they tried various ways of trying to compensate for this. They moved the seat nearer, and then, you know, it, it, did, it got worse and then they moved it back. It got worse. And then at certain points, it got worse when they left it where it was. And then they tried recruiting pilots with different heights and different reaches. And, and, and every time they tweaked it, they, they couldn't quite get it right. And they determined, and then some bright spark said, well, let's make the seat adjustable, right? So we can move it forwards and backwards, dependent upon the height of the pilot. And then all of a sudden, these fatalities, these crashes plummeted because they were making the plane fitted for the pilot's needs. And, you know, th this is what we need to do, I think, at least. And it also reminds me of like, there's a, there's a theory, right? And I don't um, profess to be an expert in nutrition, but we've had these FUD diets for a while, haven't we, where people say, the trick here is to not have carbs, cut carbs out, go Atkins, that's the way. And then everybody says, yeah, Atkins. And then there's these tremendous results from people that have been on that diet, the low carb diet and tremendous benefits. And they're posting and talking about how wonderful they are. And then it, some time will go by and a new study will come out to say, actually, that doesn't work. Uh, really, uh, what you want to do is, uh, is remove fat get fat out of your diet, that's what you need to do. Here's the research, here's the studies, here's the people that participated. You know, clearly this proves that that's the way to do it. 
and then obviously we've got keto now as well and people say well that's the way and and all the rest of it and it goes on and on and i think there's a reason why these diets keep cycling around these different diets it's not this isn't my thoughts i i read this somewhere and thought yeah you're probably right mate because we're not the same right every human being isn't the same and you know what what might work for me in terms of eating healthily might be terrible for somebody else now there was some studies into this i think there was a study and i don't remember the details of it i read about it where people's blood sugar was monitored uh, across a wide range of different people and they discovered that sometimes somebody would eat tuna for example tuna like nice healthy tuna no mayo on it just tuna and they would have a spike a really big spike in blood sugar which would then drop away very quickly which is the same as some people would get by eating a load of sugar, right? So the tuna wasn't good for those people. Then other people would eat the tuna and they wouldn't have those effects. You know, it would be a very gradual increase and, and it would level off slowly and healthily. And, and then they found other people that could, you know, drink sugary drinks and actually would have very little effect. Now, obviously most, I think it would be fair to say that the majority of people or a lot of people may fall into one of the categories. So they are quite useful as a generalization but it doesn't mean that that diet that particular diet will work for everybody so different diets will work for different people because different everybody's bodies are different planes will work better when they're piloted by people that can reach the controls and we're not all the same and we're not all the same height and risk assessments are the same too Every organization's needs, its business processes, its functions, the software that's took on board, the culture of the organization, its appetite for risk, its, uh, its processes and procedures and operational practices differ between different organizations. So how can we turn around and say, well, we're just going to apply the same thing to everybody? So I don't think that works very well. That's 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 my view on that. And I, I think there's you know there's things that we can do to compensate for that. Like what? First of all, when I speak to clients, you know, I am driven heavily by what their main concerns are. You know, I, I listen to that. It's, it's important, but also as an expert, sometimes, and sometimes at the risk of of losing a client, I, I might say, well, look, I don't actually think that you should be going down that route because often when they've made their mind up, it's quite. It's a dangerous thing to contradict them. It can lose business, but also it's the sometimes it's the right thing to do as well to to say, well, look, you know, how do you know that that that's your biggest threat? Oh, I read it in a Gartner report. Okay, well, that Gartner report, you know, its statistics. It may be talking about sixty percent. What if you're in the forty? You know, let's 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 have a look at your processes. Let's have a look at how you how your company does business. So when when I do a risk assessment, or one of our team does a risk assessment, uh, with the blessing of the client, what we like to do is understand how the company works, how it does business, how it makes money, and start there. You know, right from I don't know, like if it was a if it's a service supplying organization, you would start with okay. You know, how do your prospects reach out to you? Tell me about it. Tell me about the process that takes place. Oh, they ring up or they send an email. Okay, who reads that? Who looks at that? Who talks to the person? And then we talk it through and I say, okay, you know, you register, they get registered in a CRM or some data gets put on a spreadsheet or whatever it might be, right? Right the way through to the delivery of the service. Okay, how is, how is the service then delivered? How are they looked after? How is the project managed? How do you follow up with the clients? So we look at the whole thing operationally first, if you like, the whole thing, including HR, including marketing and sales and all the other really important parts that go with the business. And we talk it through, you know, then what happens, then what happens, then what happens? Okay, you know, you've done this. Okay, right, fine. And you work it through until you have a good understanding of how the, the, the business provides its service or produces its products or does whatever it is that it that it does to make a profit and to to meet the demands of its stakeholders. And once we have a, a good understanding of that, we might interject and ask a few what if questions. Okay, okay, so what if this were to happen or what if that were to happen or what if that system wasn't operational at that point in time? 
Okay, and then you know, what if what what do you what do you do to ensure the person you're talking to on the phone is the person they say they are? Okay, would you ever perform an operation just based on on what's been discussed on the phone if you you didn't have any proof of that, their identity? Many different things like that, right? We just we, we keep talking them through, and that and a lot of very interesting things can fall out of that. Not just from the point of view of things that might be being done wrong, but sometimes things that are are being done unnecessarily. So, you know, if a process is overcomplicated with many different procedures, when only when maybe you only really need one, you could potentially be adding risk in there, right? Because, you know, if you're using a, and, and from even, you know, from a process point of view or a technology point of view, if you're using, you know, system X, Y, and Z, to perform a particular task and X, neither X, Y, or Z is particularly robust, yet you could replace X, Y, and Z with process or operation A, which is more robust and more secure, then put that in place and just remove the problem. You know, or, or you're, you're, you're doing a procedure which is, you know, inherently insecure, just don't do it, but you don't need to do it, don't do it anymore. Like having a from a technology point of view, it's the equivalent of having a system online that does nothing and just opens itself up to the internet. It's like, well, turn it off. And so you can look at it that way from a technology point of view, but that's the same for operations as well. If you don't need to perform that operation, don't just do it because it's always been done or it's something that's happened from a legacy point of view. Revisit it. So secure the processes, secure the policies, secure the procedures, secure the operational tasks first because often that that's the easiest thing to do to, to make things more secure okay we've done that what's the residual risk what risk still sits there and it's it, often by that point it's more than halved right okay what's the residual risk right can we accept that risk is it if it's like extremely unlikely and low impact maybe we just roll with it right we take that as a as a, a chance we're willing to take if it's a bit more significant than that, we think, okay, well, let's let's put some controls in place. Now let's think of the best controls that will mitigate that risk, the best technologies. Segregate the network, put the firewalls in, move stuff to the cloud, whatever it might be, right? We look at those controls uh, and, and we apply those. Now, that's how we would go about it. And I'm not saying that we don't do ISO 27001, we don't do IASME governance, we don't do Cyber Essential, Cyber Essentials Plus, you know, CIS 20 controls, which actually I'm a big fan of. We do all those things as well as, right? But if you're driven by the framework rather than driven by the operations of the company, you, you're going to miss stuff. It's great to have both because the frameworks give you, give you stakeholder confidence. But it's also really important from a prioritizing point of view to make sure that you've looked at risk in the context of the business because that enables you to prioritize, right? What's the biggest threat to us? What's gonna, what would compromise our core business processes that would just basically mean we couldn't do business anymore or we got sued or we got huge fines from the ICO, whatever it might be. And how easy are those vulnerabilities to exploit? And how easy are they to mitigate? And all, and all of those factors will make a determination about how you prioritize the mitigation. So what you really want to do is remove the threats that have the most impact and are the most likely to happen and require the least amount of effort to fix because they're easy to fix and you might for the sake of a, a day's worth of work you could potentially cut the risk to the business by 80 percent put them at the top and how do you know which ones need to be at the top by understanding the business operationally and that's why i think you need to do that process first i think it's missed in the industry by many unfortunately well i think that's a, a perfect place to leave it, to be honest, Dave. You, you, you covered and squared that off quite nicely. Catch, catch, you, catch you next week, guys. Thanks very much. This podcast was brought to you by Samurai Digital Security, purveyors of cybersecurity solutions. Find us at samuraisecurity.co.uk and follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Samurai Security, 
tearing cybersecurity a new R since 2015.